morning. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. It's going to be a busy one, as I'm a celebrity star. Naughty Boy will be joining us in the house very shortly. And I'll be joined by the bad boy of British motorsport when top racing driver Jason Plato will be here as well. That's going to be a fun one. And I'll be exploring the coastline of Northumberland on a lacy lake, my food adventures. And we've got recipes all the way from top chefs Jude Kiriyama uh, and the very talented Asma Khan will be here as well. And don't miss this week's Little Masterclass. We'll be sharing some fantastic recipe ideas with the humble Jersey Royal Potato that's banging season right now. And that's not all, because I'm here with a top, top chef who's a true master of French cuisine. It's Daniel Gamish. Ching, 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 Chefy. Ching, welcome to the house again. Thank you. How are you? I'm uh, much better now. Thank you so much. Fabulous. It's good to have you here as well. You're going to be cooking for us later on in the show. What are you going to be making there? Yeah, I'm going to do a lovely uh, rump of lamb pan roasted, but with a difference. I'm going to uh, skew it with some licorice root, served with simple some, uh, some uh, Côte de bed. And, uh, well, it always, you always make it look simple and it always tastes amazing. That's the great thing about having well, you here as yeah. well. So but, I, uh, thought, I thought I'd cook, you've got your eye on this I little know, fish, haven't you, really? Know, you know why, because... <laughs> so I'm... he's got his eye straight away on this beautiful bit of place. Absolutely so I thought stunning. we'd do some beautiful pan-fried place. With a little, I mean, he calls it a little nage, little French nage, 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 nage which yeah. is a, it's a little stew, little very very quick stew of some peas, some broad beans. We got some mosh too. We got some beautiful asparagus, a little bit of wild garlic. Again, you can make this with any ingredient that cooks in a similar sort of time. Yeah. The, all these ingredients are going to cook in about three or four minutes, no more than that. But we've got a beautiful bit of place Stun with this. Stunning. Exactly. But the pride of this is going to be what I'm going to introduce you to in a minute. But uh, that's going to be the key to this dish, really, as well as this amazing fish. Now, nature's amazing. Uh, you've got almost like paint by dots, but you've also got fill it by lines. Oh, no, it's just... And look, you've got and a line. And the line is made for you. It's just... The line is made for you, exactly. Yeah. And we take our knife, and this is a little filleting knife. It just allows you, you can see, when you fill it in fish, if you ever get the chance to do it, have a go at it. The key to this is, is long sweeping lines. I think too many people start doing yes. small cuts. And you, and you can see it as well on the fillet and on the bone. You can see yeah. it on the fillet, but also you can see when you end, the end product looks like you've done, just done six goujons rather than a whole fillet of fish. Yeah, absolutely. But you yes, just yes. take a nice sweeping line. And this only comes with practice, really. And I'm, to be honest with you, pretty slow compared with people who do it for a living but you've got a beautiful piece of fish there like that. And you do the same thing on the other side as well, but it's absolutely glorious. But the whole point of this dish, as I said over here, the, the shining light of this isn't just the place that we've got over here, but this actually comes from the seaside as well, are these amazing Morecambe Bay shrimps. So these are one of my favourite ingredients in Beautiful. the world. Yeah. Now, you've only tried these once, have you? I only tried that once, yes, that's correct. And I don't know why, for some reason, and that's why I used to live in Scotland, actually. Right. And uh, um, it was part of a menu as a kind of starter on the table, and yeah. I said, oh, let's try that. It was delightful, actually, yeah. and, and for some reason, after that, you don't think about it. But, but they are uh, amazing. They are produced in Morecambe, which we're going yeah. to go to now. Uh, we're going to meet up with this amazing lady, uh, and this lady's... Well, she's ended up buying this amazing company. It's uh, Claire Worrell from Furnace Fish. Uh, she's down the line now. I can see you. Good morning to you. How are you? Morning, James. I'm fine, thank you. Very good. I'm, I, so I'm going to be filleting this fish. You can tell us how it all started, because... Was it you, 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 your, your uncle started the business, was it? That's how it all started? Yes. Yeah, my um, uncle Les, he started the business. He was a keen fisherman, shrimp fisherman. Um, initially, um, he started the business and it supplied just to hotels and restaurants back in the early 70s. But he'd been fishing for shrimp since he was a young lad. Um, so and that was his passion. Tell me about when he started it, really, because, I mean, it's notoriously quite risky and quite dangerous, particularly when, when he was a young, young lad starting out, because didn't it all used to be done by hand? He used to go fishing for it. Um, yeah, so um, or originally it was with horse and cart. Ah, yes. So mm -hmm. the horse would pull the cart, fishermen would sit on the cart, and they'd, um, they'd run the nets out into the channels of water. Um, and, and Les's job um, was to walk when he was a child in front of the horse to make sure there was no sinking stand. So, that, nice. So you'd send, send Les out first before yeah. the horse <laughs> to see whether it was actually quicksand. Yeah. Um, and then um, tractors replaced the horses. 
um, and then they would pull a trailer um, alongside the tractor that would go into the channel and then the nets would obviously fish for the shrimps. Now, I find the whole process absolutely fascinating. So why why Morecambe and why why shrimps in Morecambe? What makes it so special? Is it the tide? Is it the area? So why, why, what makes it's, it so special? It's the tide. It's the tide. Now, we're, we're, we're based in Flutborough, which is the east side of Morecambe Bay. Um, so on this side of the um, bay, the east and also down towards Ulverston, we'll fish with tractors um, because the tide goes out, right out. And But on the Markham side, they will actually fish with small boats because that, the tide stays in at that side. Tell me the process of making the shrimp then. How, how do you get from the raw material to what we've got in front of over, over here, the classic Markham Bay potted shrimp? How do we get there? You don't need to tell us the recipe, but how do we get to that stage? No. So the, so the shrimps, um, once they've been peeled, they are then um, boiled in the butter and the secret spices. Um, and they're boiled in butter um, for 10 minutes. Then they're drained off um, and potted. And that's what gives them, them plumps up the shrimp because it soaks in the spices and butter. They're then put, placed into the pots. And then we put local butter onto the top of on the top of those, and that's what seals the shrimps. Um, and that's what it used to be, that they didn't need refrigeration. That was the old-fashioned way of, um, you know, by putting the butter on the top of them. So that's what it, um, yeah. So that got refrigeration. Well, I wish you all the very best with yeah, it as well. Thank good. you for being a part good. of this as well. And next time I'm up there, I'm going to come and see you and see how, the, see how you fish for them. But Yeah, you should do. I will do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye. See, how, bye. Amazing, how amazing is that, you see? So we've got a beautiful bit of place gone in here, a bit of salt and pepper gone in here. And the butter, what I've done is I've whisked this all up. So I'm doing this while Claire's watching on. But the idea is you whip this all up and it produces this much more spicier butter, you see, this one. This is probably a little bit too spicy for a lot of people, but you take this amazing sort of spice in there, and we well, take it. You can take it, that's the oh, thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the king with this. Yeah. You can take it. So we got a lovely bit of fish. I'll just turn that down a little bit. So then we got, you know, you've got this little nage, and this little nage is so, so easy. You take a little bit of this butter. Yeah, it's very nice. Like but that. do you know why they call it a nage, uh, James? Go on, then. Because the uh, nage means swimming, so the vegetable's still loose within the water. So, so that's that's why. See? So we start. I knew there's a reason why they put you here next to me for this dish. You see? Ah, uh, no, no. this is it. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why it's called a nage, which is quite charming actually, and goes well with fish. So yeah, beautiful, per perfect. So you've got a nice little bit of place there, and we're just going to finish this off with just some lemon. I think the key to this is simplicity more than anything oh, else. I absolutely agree, hundred percent. So we've got our nice little bit of look at the potty shrimp with the butter and everything. We can fire this up again now. That so this will lovely. start. But that's the thing, uh, James, with produce like you've got there, you can only go simple. There's no reason why yeah. we should complicate. A little bit of lemon. Yeah, I mean, I just eat, even eat it like that oh. in there. It's just oh, absolutely... I love it. You, you, you've got to convert on fish in here. I mean, <laughs> as you know, it's just... But look, you've got your lovely bit of... And then we bring this all together. Now, what you can do is we can season this up now. So salt and pepper. Now, finally, what we do with this is I take some wild garlic. This you don't have to, you just use parsley. If you want, but, but a little bit of wild garlic in here. And this is almost last minute. And then we're ready. That's all it needs. You're quite right, yeah. Then we're ready to plate, really. So you've got the peas, the broad beans, the asparagus. Wonderful. Pea shoots if you want to do, but, but you just wilt this... Don't even need... A bit, bit of wild garlic, garlic down. Ah, look at that. Touch of lemon. A little bit of lemon. That's it. Perfect. Perfect. And Perfect. then we can grab our nice little dish. And look at the colour from the, the, the shrimp butter. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? But, yeah, potted shrimps. Oh, my God. <laughs> they're just... This, yeah, it, they're just... If I ever I see them on the menu, they're definitely the one that I'd go for, but beautiful. You've got this lovely little bit of... And this is just butter and water. Remember, this That's is just it. not melted butter. Proper, it's butter yeah. and water. Proper now. You get this ama amazing sauce from it as well. Like that. And then we've got a lovely bit of grilled... A oh, pan fried fish. Yeah, you go don't with need it. Quite right. Pan fried is even better. You don't even need to grill it. But you've got a lovely bit of fish to go with it. Wow. And what wow. I finally do is take a few of these, few of these shrimps over the top. There you have it. 
my pan-fried place. Bon appétit. Done. <laughs> There you go, Chefy. Bon appetit. Ah oh, la la, thank you so much. Second time you tried potty shrimp, slightly different. But yes. I look the fish. These are amazing, by the way. Uh, the you... fish, the softness of the fish. Mm. Oh, come on. Fresh. Potty shrimps are amazing. Very nice, huh? Got the fish Potty... beautiful. Ah, but, yeah. the, but the shrimps. Together, I think, with, with the vegetables as well. It goes extremely well, yeah. But these, whether you just have them on toast as well, but, it's, you know, have a go at doing that with just whipping, whipping them in butter. You spice it a little bit more. Yeah, but it actually goes very well together. goes well with that. Yeah. Very well, yeah. Because it's a little bit too buttery and not enough spicy because the spice is dispersed through the water. I think you just need to add a little bit more if you're going to do that way, but you get an amazing sauce from it as well. Mm. There you go. Beautiful. Bon appetit. That's a good start. Right, Daniel will be cooking for us shortly, and I'll be talking to I'm a Celebrity Star Naughty Boy in a bit, but don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're heading to the other side of the country uh, and the beaches of Northumberland this time. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be chatting to Naughty Boy very shortly, and I'll be laying on lunch for my old mate, Jason Plato, a little later on in the show. Right, it's time to take a look back at one of my favourite food adventures. This week, I'm meeting up with a local lad and top chef, Kenny Atkinson, who you know. Uh, I know Kenny, yeah. Uh, an amazing chef uh, from the north, uh, and we're on a culinary tour of the Northumberland stunning scenery. Enjoy this one. There's nothing better than a leisurely boat trip, you see. Do you know what it is? I absolutely love this. Eh? It brings back a lot of memories, this does. It's a very special part of the world, isn't it, really? It is. Do you know what it is? I didn't realise how special it was until I moved back a few years ago. So have you ever been to this island, then? Never been to this island. Never so I'm been? Actually, no, I'm looking forward to You're this You're from over there. <laughs> <laughs> We're heading to Cockett Island, home to around 40,000 nesting seabirds, including the beautiful but endangered puffin. Never seen a puffin. Neither have I. Never seen a puffin. Well, you've never been to the island. That's the reason why you've never seen a puffin. <laughs> and there are loads of them, look. You, 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 you can actually see them all. Yeah. Just sit on the water. As a dedicated bird sanctuary, you can't land on Cockett Island, but luckily Skipper Dave knows all about it. Welcome to Cockett Island. How are you doing, Dave? Good to Cougat see you. Cockett Island belongs in Duke of Northumberland. The land's leased to the RSPB for the bird sanctuary there, and a bit of late house is on as leased to Trinity House. I mean, there must be some quite rare birds on the island. Aye, it's the only place in the British Isles where these rare roseate terns nest and breeds. But you can tell how good the quality of the, the water is and the seafood, everything, because there's, there's also hundreds of seals everywhere. Oh, aye, the seals, there must be plenty to keep them growing, because we've got plenty of seals as well. Yeah. Amazing, though. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, have I. I'm just actually gobsmacked at the amount of puffins that are flying wrong with. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> it was so wonderful to be so close to nature and to see so many rare birds protected. Sustainability is also a key mantra to the fishing industry here. 75% of fish caught in the UK is exported, putting a huge pressure on stocks in our sea. The Northumberland Seafood Centre has been set up to help protect endangered species. Andrew Gooding runs the Lobster Hatchery, an important project to help ensure future stocks of shellfish for all. I'm looking forward to seeing this. Oh, I'm excited for this. How are you doing? All right. How are you? You all right? So, so explain to us what this place is. Well, this is the, the Lobster Hatchery. Yeah. And um, what we're about is rearing young lobsters just to give them a better chance when they get back into the sea. So the lobsters in, in this tank are all our buried hens, hens because the female, and buried because they're holding all their eggs under the body, and they can be holding up to about 20,000 eggs. At sea, only one of them is likely to make it to be an adult. What, from 20,000? From 20,000. But when you look at how small the larvae are, which are down here... So they're mini lobsters? They're, they're the mini lobsters. I mean, anything and everything at the sea can just be hoovering up them by the bucket load. Yeah. So where, where do we go from this stage, then? You take them from there and put them where? Yeah, so from here, we put them into, into the next tank. 
these they come in here every day. So we transfer from the tanks that we just had a look at. Yeah. They come in here and we can feed them once they get into, into these tanks. Why is it circulating? No matter what we feed them in here, they've got a real penchant for each other. Cannibalism is our biggest problem in the hatchery and trying to control really? that is, um, is one of our main problems. So right. the more we can keep the water moving, the less chance they've got of grabbing hold of each other. It's like a lobster tumble dryer. <laughs> it is a bit. It is a bit. <laughs> Love it. So we move them on to where they're, they're in separate pens from each other. So you really do have to keep them separate we really at do. this stage. Yeah, so now they're all in, in separate pens and they're getting quite ferocious little beasties now. And how old are these ones now? These are anything from about six weeks upwards. Six weeks. Yeah. So all these are of a size now that can go back to sea. What a great idea. It's fantastic. Make sure you appreciate them a lot more. That's something that we really want people to do is appreciate yeah. lobsters because it's, you know, these are something that we're world renowned for. You know? yeah. So it should be right up there as a as a pinnacle of as a nation what we what we celebrate in terms of food. Hats off to the Northumberland Seafood Centre, who are doing so much to ensure healthy stocks of lobsters grow in our seas. My time sadly in Northumberland is nearly up, and I've loved every minute of touring this area, but I've got time for one more final cook and it's a local speciality. Right, I thought I'd do a fabulous dish, a real classic round here. We're going to make singing hinnies, that's what we're going to make. Hinnies a term of endearment around here, um, but the singing bit is the sizzling bit, which we're going to get uh, on there. Uh, but I thought I'd just run through the ingredients first. Really simple little, it's like a bannock cake, really. We've got in here some flour, I've got in here some uh, currants, some mixed peel, sultanas, it's up to you, whatever you put in here. A um, little bit of milk, some lemon, and then baking powder, cream of tartar, but the key to it is this fella over here. This is the lard and the butter. I'll get to that in a minute. So the first thing we do is add out sort of dry ingredients first. So I've got my baking powder, because it says on the bottom, a little bit of baking powder in here, and about half the amount of cream of tartar. This will give it a little bit of acidity. Now, these are not necessarily sweets. You can actually serve them with cheese if you wanted to, but they'll work if you sprinkle with a bit of sugar, like I'm going to do, serve it with a nice little curd. And then what we do is we add a pinch of salt and then mix this together. Now, this is the important bit. You've got butter, never margarine. Oh. And it has to be lard, lard pig fat, all right? And we mix the two together. And it's always a good idea just to do this with your fingertips. And this is where these are always best made by hand. If you do these in the machine, you tend to overmix it. And because of that, you toughen up the gluten in the flour and they become too tough, too firm. Now, my granny used to do this with her fingertips and rubbing together this butter and lard while she watched an episode of Corrie. That took about half an hour. I'll do this in about five minutes. I've got bigger hands. Look at the castle. So once we've mixed this together, it should look like a little crumble topping, really. So once you get to that stage, we can add the rest of our ingredients. I've got in here some sultanas, currants, bit of mixed peel. It's either or, or all of them. Whatever you want to do, really, they can all go in. A little bit of lemon zest. A little bit of lemon zest. And then milk. And then this is where you just create a little well in the centre. Pop the milk in and mix this in by hand. And this will all come together like a little simple sort of scone mixture, really, I suppose. And then we can roll it out. It's really funny being here, actually, because I'm from sort of further south. I'm a southerner up here, but about 60, 70 miles further south is where most people from up here used to go on holiday down there. And we used to come up here. It used to be like swapping houses. Now, this is the type of mixture that you're looking for. It's a little bit more sticky than scones. You see, it's quite tacky, which is just what we want. And then, a bit of flour, just a little bit. A bit of flour, and then just simply roll these out. I love doing stuff like this. Recipes that have been around for years and years and years. So much history, a bit like the castle behind me with this sort of stuff. They used to make these for coal miners all around here, so they would go off to work with them. You can just imagine going off to work with them, warm in the pockets. And then all we do is just grab a cutter, whatever size you want, really, and just cut these out. The temptation is to make them too thin. They want to puff up a little bit, so... Cut them in pieces like that. Now, to cook these, you cook them on a griddle plate or a skillet, 
and get it nice and hot, which this is, because this is the crucial part of it. This is the singing part of the singing hinny. The singing bit is the sizzle you get from the cooking, where you cook it in a little bit of lard and a little bit of butter. So in here, we use a combination of the two. Lard on and butter on. And get this nice and hot. So then we pop these little fellas straight on. That look pretty good, don't they? Now, while that's cooking, the temptation is to get this way too hot and they burn on the outside, not cook in the centre. So you've got to be really careful with it, the temperature. So just leave those cooking away nicely. Meanwhile, I'm going to serve this. This isn't traditional. Sometimes you serve these with cheese as well, which is the race. You don't have to sprinkle with sugar, but I love puddings, as you can tell. But we're going to use a combination of full-fat cream cheese, full-fat creme fraiche, full-fat lemon curd, put it all together, that's it. So you just take the creme fraiche in here, the cream cheese, give this a quick mix together. Now, if you want to sweeten this up, a sprinkling of sugar, or you can use some local honey, if you want. But I'm going to take this with me on my journey. So what I'm going to do is going to take this lemon curd, like that. And we're just going to mix it like that. Because this reminds me of when I was on the seafront on my holiday. Ripple ice cream. We're going to take this, and before we serve it, I'm just going to sprinkle on some sugar over the top. And then what we do is lift these up. Pop them all around there. And you can see the cream of tartar and the baking powder start to puff up these. And there you have it, my singing hinny. Eee! Sorry about that, I just had to. A sweet treat in honour of glorious Northumberland. It's an amazing part of the world, that, and Northumberland. The coastline is absolutely Yeah, I don't know too much of that area, and, and I need to visit. Uh, you're quite right. Oh, there's I've, castles I've all the way up the coastline. It's, I've heard it's incredible. wonderful, yeah. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. And it's, it's a beautiful. good excuse to go to Kenny's restaurant. Exactly. So. It's a good excuse to go to Kenny's restaurant. Yeah, well. absolutely. It's a beautiful part of the world. Now, Danny will be cooking for us very shortly. You've got an amazing dish. You're going to be cooking lamb? Yeah, I'm going to cook a uh, lamb ramp with some licorice. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. You're going to be cooking that in a minute. And we've got chefs uh, Jude Kiriyama and Asma Khan for us on the show a little bit later. And if you, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. We'll be cooking for top music producer, and I'm a celebrity star, Naughty Boy. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, coming up, we've got a masterclass in Jersey Royal potatoes that are banging season, as I said at the moment. And Chef Daniel Galmish will be in the kitchen very shortly. But first, I'm here with a British music producer who's best known for working with the likes of Beyonce and battling it out in all those Bush Tucker trials. It's fabulous. Naughty Boy! Yeah. First of all, why on earth did you do it? <laughs> you, <laughs> you're shaking your head now. <laughs> you know what? Looking back on it, I'm glad I did because I did overcome so many fears that I thought I had, and you know, um, snakes especially, and also um, I've never thought of myself as a celeb, and I still don't. But I'm, that was an experience, and I thought I can take in my spices, which you apparently can't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to save the. The rest of the contestants from bland food, but apparently that's part of the show. That's part. That's how yeah. you got to deal with. But you haven't got bland food today. We got a nice Korean dish as well because I yes. saw you cooking on the stars recently as yes. well. So uh, your mentor was Korean as well. So we thought we'd do. I thought we'd do a lovely little sea bass with chagua and aubergines, uh, some beautiful paste. We've got some Korean paste in there and some nice little fresh herbs. So it's all about the bass first of all, which is going to taste this and cut this up into chunks really. Mm -hmm. But reading about you and reading about your your story, your story is fascinating. I'm sure it's. Going to be a movie one day because <laughs> your story from growing up as a kid, mm. lover of music, yes, not knowing how to get in the music industry, no. notoriously difficult. Mm. You're almost on your last ten quid. I, I was on my last ten quid, <laughs> uh, and and you you then then got the opportunity to sort of be on a on a TV show like a quiz show. Yeah, I wanted fill in the blanks after that. It's just <laughs> no. Do you know I 
I applied for a grant at the same time Princess Trust grant, and yeah. then I applied for a game show, Deal or No Deal, because I knew there wasn't any questions. It was like, if it was meant to be, and I was gonna win some money and change my life, then I thought I'd just I applied thinking I wasn't gonna get it, and then before I knew it, I was in front of Noel Edmonds and <laughs> <laughs> playing uh, opening boxes. And yeah. when it came to my, my game, I, I said to Noel um, that I wanna be a big music producer one day, so I'm gonna use this money. So I won 44,000 pounds, and I literally used that to build a studio in my mom and dad's shed. And Game... you built, I mean, this is the amazing story. You built a studio in your mom and dad's shed. Yes. And then, not very long afterwards, you have the likes of Beyonce calling you. Oh, that was a bit further down well, the not, line. Not, not that, when we're talking about in a career, in a oh, music yeah. career that can last 40, 50 years, you're not that old. No, but Emily Sandy was the first, <laughs> That was the project, the first project I did, and that was most of that was in the shed. And then before I knew it, <laughs> Emily was this massive superstar, and deservedly so. But the story continues, and my next album is out this year. And um, yeah, there's a lot of surprises. Well, that was a good cue. You, you're obviously been doing this PR bit quite a while. So t tell <laughs> well, us I've been on a celeb. Tell us about the new album. I've got the aubergine, which I'm going to cook on here. I'm just going to take a little bit of sea bass, ginger and garlic over the top, and pop it in the oven. But tell us about your new new album then, because so my new album is called Heartland. It's out later this year, but my album was delayed because sadly five years ago my mum had a stroke, and I live with my mum and my mum's carer now, which I'm I'm grateful I can do but I did slow things down for the first couple of years. Yeah. But then when um, COVID happened, I just, everyone just got into something and I just managed to finish my album and become a, a better chef as well. Still not there though. Well, uh, you're, you're, I tell you what, you're, you are, you are, because yeah. we've seen you, seen you cook before as well, but we just got a little, I know you got one eye on this and one eye on the fish. We, we're cooking our fish in the oven here. We just yes. got our, our sea bass in there. It'll take about three or four minutes. The aubergines are cooking on there, and I'm sure you've used this, you've this, used this Korean place before. So Judy, is that is that similar to like Nasi Goreng? Yeah, it's, yeah, gucho, guchong, well, it's it's uh, it's it's this amazing Korean paste, and it's it's made out of fermented uh, uh, rice, but also uh, uh, the chili, and it's it's produced it's produced this amazing background flavour that when I mix it with soy and everything else, it's, okay. you love that sort of fusion food. This is, is it, it that magic paste that... Gu Chu Chong, or yes. Gu Chao Chong, or however you pronounce it, but there's different ways of pronouncing it, but, that, but you get this amazing sort of paste, this, this beautiful sticky paste. You get that from the rice and everything else in there. And then we're going to add that to the mixture of ginger and some garlic and everything else. It produces this amazing, simple little sauce with it as well. Like that. So you've got this gorgeous little sauce. But it must be quite fascinating doing what you're doing and, and, and being able to work with these amazing people around the globe as well. Oh my God, like, I never expected you to. You must pinch yourself, don't I you? I do, I like, all the time. Yeah. But um, for me, it's like, what, what am I going to do next? I don't, I don't get too comfortable. Like, even after Beyonce called me, I was, <laughs> I was, a, I was like, this is, I've made it, I've made, I've really made it now. But then, it's still, it's like, what's next now? Because for my album, like, look, there's so many names that I've worked with that I didn't expect to. I can't name all of them, but I've done. So is the shed still there? The, the shed the, is still there. The shed is still there. It's got to be there, though. But it, it, now it's become what it was initially, which was a pots and pan shed. And right. So there's my little section in the shed there, but because I've moved to Buck Buckinghamshire now, so I've. Got, I've upgraded my shed. Right. Um, but um, those are the times that you kind of miss as well, when you're not sure what's going to happen and is this going to be successful. Uh, I remember when me and Emily wrote Clown and to see what it became after that, but we wrote it in an empty room with just the piano. And, you know, when you we don't have much, you do miss those moments of what it takes to create something. But I suppose the, the nature of that and all the all the famous tracks and you, you talk about, you know, Beatles and all that kind of stuff. Mm. The, it's the, almost the purity of it. They don't have all the fancy gear. They no. Don't have, do you think it's, it's like... Yeah, my whole thing was, when, before I went on Deal or No Deal, I had all these ideas in my head. I just needed to transfer them out there into a laptop or out the speakers. I wasn't thinking about, oh, I need this equipment or I need this synth, you know, because I was hearing it there. And then, so that was the journey. <laughs> and right. it still is. It still is a journey, and it's a, journey, it's a journey that we all like to follow as well. So look, you've got a nice little bit of paste over here. So the key to this really is get this this, this combination of sweet and sour. And yes. you want this sort of sweetness with it as well. That's why I've added some sugar. The sourness comes in the form of lime. So it's that lime, 
it's the ginger and the garlic, that kind of stuff. Mm. But you get this amazing flavour from it as well. So a little bit of lime zest right at the end, like that. And I've got the nice little bit of sea bass, but lime juice in here as well. You just got a nice little squeeze. Oop. Take that one out. Squeeze of that in there. And then we'll take our little sea bass out. Oh, nice. Which you can just see. Look at that. Oh, wow. Happy with that? Yes. It's not bad. Yeah. Can I send a picture to Judy Jew and say, <laughs> that, say that we <laughs> yeah. made it together? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, we could just put a little bit of lime over the top and then just a touch of oil, which is what, a little bit of oil over the top. And then you've got the aubergines, which you just allow to rest nicely. Mm -hmm. And you've got these amazing sort of coloured with everything else. We just lift this off and we can start to pile all this lot on, really, as well. But you must have enjoyed doing that cooking with the stars, didn't you? You must have enjoyed no, that. No, I did. I made like friends like Denise. Uh, Denise you looked Pennell, as if you were enjoying it. Um, Johnny Vegas and Shirley. So, but then also the chefs. I met Jack Stein, who's um, Rick Stein's son. Yeah. And um, there was uh, Francesco, who I love as well. Because yeah, as well as your music, like I said, the food is such a great influence on the year. You've you've now going into the world of pop up places yes. and, and and venture into. The, didn't hasn't the mayor asked you to? To do a pop-up, Mayor yes, of London? Yes, um, so there's an annual Eid celebration in Trafalgar Square and I'll be doing a Naughty Boy Kitchen pop-up, which I'm a bit nervous about because there's expecting, like, eight to 10,000 people. <laughs> but to be honest, like, when I started cooking five years ago, it was because my mum stopped cooking and she hasn't cooked since. So as I'm the youngest son and I wanted... I think it was a coping mechanism. I was because yeah. I used to get my mum's food delivered to me every day. My Addison Lee bill was ridiculous. But then, <laughs> when that happened, I was like, "No, I need to step up now. I need to start cooking for mum." And then there's mom, one of mum's favourite dishes is um, it's baby pumpkin and spring lamb. Yeah. But so I've been trying to master that over the last couple of years. So initially it was cooking for her, but then the shepherd's pie thing. During the when I was cooking on my Instagram in lockdown, I just had so many people asking if they could try it. So last year, just before I went in the castle, I, I did a pop up at Box Park in Croydon, yeah. and I just can't believe how many people came and they we just kept on selling out of the shepherd's pie. And so I did a vegan shepherd's pie as well. But I'm not a fan of the vegan meat alternative, like vegan mince. I think vegan You've shepherd's... You've got to make it veg. There's so many great vegetables yeah, out there. Like, Utilise the veg. Don't there's so many beans. Bake like... it and cover it up. Just use proper, yeah. proper food. So yeah. there's a vegan shepherd's pie with, like, lentils, kidney beans and black beans, and which, which actually works. And then I do um, a chilli cheese and coriander toasty which is just a snack, really. I'll tell you what, then. If I take a Saturday morning off, you can just take over from me, can you really? No, but I'd love to cook my... <laughs> I'd love to make the fish and chips samosa with you one day because I think the masses will love something like that because fish and chips, that's a staple British... I'll tell you, know. you what we'll do, then. We'll get Sat Baines, who's the master at samosas, I know, two Michelin star Sat Baines. Wow. And you can try and top, top trump his samosas. I'd love that. There you go. There no, you go. I'm, I'm a student of life, so I'm just learning. I'm <laughs> learning all the time. He's doing a jo good job learning, isn't he, really? But there you have it, my lovely Korean wow. sea bus with uh, a nice little char grilled aubergines and, and mint and coriander. Easy as that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Come on. There we go. Bon appetit. Wow, thank you, sir. I'm into that. Tell me what you think of that one. Yeah, yeah. That's a meal and a half, isn't it, really? Yeah. I've got a little bit of sea bass. I might try taste a little bit over here, but with a little bit of the sauce. But tell me what you think. It's a little bit of spice in it, because I know you like a little bit of spice in there yeah. as well. It's a little naughty kick, you know? It just wants to be a nice little bit of a kick. Mmm. Oh, wow. Sweet, oh, sour, wow. bitter. Is this all for me? It's all for you. No, it's all for you. You can take it away with no, you. No, no, exactly. no, I'm joking, I'm joking. But no. it's lovely. It's just with the like... aubergine and everything else. Nice little bit of sea bass. And the mint as well. Yeah, mint works as well. There you go. Naughty boy, everybody! Yay! Thank you. Right, top racing by Jason Plater will be here later, and there's an unmissable masterclass in Jersey Rolls coming right up. But join me again after the break when Daniel Garmiche will be working his magic in the kitchen. I'll see you in a bit.
Welcome back. Now I'll be sharing some recipes uh, with Jersey Roll potatoes, which are bang in season in this week's Little Masterclass. But first, it's an honour to be joined in the kitchen, again by a man who's probably worked in more Michelin-style restaurants than any other chef on the planet. It's the amazing Daniel Gavish. Thank you. I was going to say, more three-star Michelin restaurants than anybody else yeah, on the planet. But I, I, you've worked in quite a few over the years. I, I did, actually, yeah. Actually, I was calculating the other day uh, from my apprenticeship to... The vineyard I've worked, it's all about Michelin star. Oh, Michelin my stars. Life. I know. And you and ended up getting your own in Scotland. Was my it? first one was in Scotland, yeah. yeah. Uh, which I, I would never have dreamed yeah. already to have a star, but to have that in Scotland. I love it how he says for it's a French his first one. His first one, because he's gone to open to it, open to another few restaurants. No, and sorry, yeah, no, but, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? But you didn't, I, I think as a young boy, I never realized. And, I was going to move to Scotland for, yeah. you know, the, the way well, life... Probably never moved from France, no? Right, right. yes, yeah. because French people at that time, I, I was doing my training, always was so French, in a way, yeah. you know what I mean? So tell um, us about this recipe then, uh, anyway, so Lamb uh, and licorice. Yes, yeah, so I started to... That's great we talk about Scotland, because I started uh, to uh, think about that idea when I was in Scotland, because the lamb was amazing. Yeah. And I had the chance and privilege to have some lamb from Orkney Island, which, yeah. to this day, I think it's, for me, possibly the best in Europe. Yeah. Really unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I think some, somebody like uh, Monsieur Robuchon would, would back me up, because he was one of the first Frenchmen in his uh, uh, Swiss star in Paris to have Ockney lime on his uh, on It is his incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a diet, isn't it, more than Ah, fa exactly. Fabulous. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. licorice root. So, yeah. uh, that as well is another childhood memory because in France and Spain, we go to school and we're quite likely to stop in a small shop and buy a thing. Chew it. And we chew it. Yeah. And, and I always love this very earthy. It's not obviously like the licorice, the sweet you buy, which, you know, the rolled up, yeah. really dark, whatever. Yeah. But there's this kind of really great fragrance. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously, like you, say, you said earlier, the lamb got different diet, different yeah. depending where it is, from, uh, from uh, flowers in a meadow to roots to seaweed. So what do you do with licorice anyway? What, so what have you done with it licorice first? in warm water, the reason we put in warm water is soften the licorice, okay. which means it allows you to peel it like that. Yeah. So does it, how long do you have to put it in warm water for then? Well, uh, Two hours, about one okay. or two hours, but if, yeah. if you can uh, start it to leave it overnight in warm water and redo yeah. it on the following morning. Yeah. But it does allow you to do this lovely peeling there. Yeah. Okay? Which uh, you can smell it as you peel it, which I, I love that. It's wonderful. And it's important to keep the peelings as well with this. As it well, is it? very important to yeah. keep the peeling. And we're going to show yeah. why just in a second. Not only will it give the flavor, but it, it will disperse a little bit of this lovely color and give you a, a greeny thing. So that's why you got really soft, you can see, and that's, that's help you a lot to be able also to cut the licorice. So, okay. uh, lamb in here. You just take a small skewer or a knife or whatever you got there. Yeah. Yeah. And while that is in like that, you're going to put that in and push it through there, just like that. Voila, that's yeah. all you do, you remove it. And you're you going know. to start the cooking in this pan, And we're going to start the cooking okay. now. Okay. Absolutely. So, yes, um, what a battle. So, like you said, you, you've worked in all manner of different restaurants. You keep yourself busy because in, in lockdown, you've been working on this. This is... And you kindly sent me one of these in lockdown. We got this I did, amazing book. I did, so because... Uh, tell, us about the, tell us about the new books. This is not your first book. That's my third one. Yeah. That's my third one. So, tell us and, about this uh, thing. So, uh, what was really interesting during... during Lockdown, uh, James, and uh, I, I had time to relook at the season yeah. because we had we had peace. There was no nothing around, nothing to do, and I'm lucky yeah. to live completely in the countryside. So uh, I had time to relook, and I thought about a new recipe and walking down and see the the proper season. It, yeah. it seems that they've always been there, but there's some time with the pace of life. Well, as chefs, we never get to think about anything other than what we're doing right in front of us, don't we? Voila, exactly. Whereas and we you... never got the opportunity to do anything no. like that. So you yeah. had to then... Yes, You had time to think, because time, time is a thing that, that hospitality never had. Yes, you know? exactly. And, and, that's, and that's, uh, that's what exactly happened. And I said, um, of course, this is season of that. Of course, this is the season of this. And uh, I think which is good in chefs, we've got our favourite ingredient. That's we, my favourite ingredient. I'm looking at it now. Skate. Well, there you go. Oh, well, I love that too. <laughs> yeah. And we wait for season. Do you know what I yeah. mean? We wait for that produce. For yeah. Me, for example, I love apricot. 
because of the smell and everything. It uh, represents the sun. It represents uh, late spring, beginning of summer. So it's one of the things. Yeah. And well, I look in Jersey Rolls later on in the show right. as well. You can tell well, that because the quality oh, of the ingredients. Absolutely. Yeah. So, for example, I'm choosing apricot, but Jersey Rolls, right, yeah, yeah. why not? Of course, spring lamb, you know. Uh, it's all interesting that. you say this about, you know, the, about, about the French chefs praising the lamb we produce in this country. I do believe we've got the best lamb in the oh, world. Oh, I, I mean... Do. As you know, I've been Thanks. living here for a while, and, and without any doubt, I can say yeah. that the Orkney Island is my favourite lamb. Difficult to get, I know, because tend to keep it uh, a bit more for Scotland. Yeah. And keep it for you... themselves. That's yes. that Tom Kitchen, he keeps taking it all. Well, that's it, exactly. <laughs> but if you buy it, actually, you can only buy the whole lot. Huh? Yeah. They, they rarely give it as a, a species. Yeah. So, so anyway, you're sealing, sealing off the lamb. Seal yeah. it off the lamb, yeah. yeah. Nicely done, like this. Okay, okay so now we, we're there. We've got yep. really nice colour, as you can see there. Perfect. So let's put that on. Voilà, about, so eight to ten minutes about, huh? Yeah, OK. 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 So this is... We've got one that's resting out the back there. So yes. This yeah. is the, the... I'm going yeah. to do the sauce now, yeah. Yeah. So I keep a little bit of the cube. We've got yeah. beautiful uh, lamb jus in here, because it's always nice to have a little bit lamb jus. Not too much. It's not a swimming pool, and we're going to do <laughs> that. <laughs> And uh, yeah. my boss used to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's come automatically. I didn't even think until you, <laughs> until you did smile. I said, oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> and I'm you, going... came to, you came to... What, what age did you come to, from France to the UK, then? What? What did I come to? Yeah. Well, I had an interview in Paris for a head chef position, and I didn't know the head chef position was in Scotland, right. in Nokinam, <laughs> and that's why it's all happened. Right. Uh, Sometimes life is strange, uh, James, you know. It's just... Uh... And then what we all... I mean, what, one thing that fascinates me about French chefs coming to the UK, because back then, you know, there was a movement happening in, in food in, in the UK that the French really didn't know about, really. It wasn't that well known. You yes. could feel it in the, sort of the 80s, really. It was starting to move in a, in a rapidly moving forward, forward direction. Yes, what did, what did your parents think of you going, right, I, I'm going to go home, I'm not going to be a surgeon, but I'm also going to go... Oh, not, my I'm dad! <laughs> oh, my dad, he said, you must be crazy. He said, why do you want to go? He said, well, you're going to a country where the food is... Uh, and he said, anyway, why would you like to be a chef for? <laughs> he said, to work hours and hours and earn nothing and whatever. And when I had uh, my first uh, Michelin star... Yeah. Few months later, few months later, and I told my mom, and uh, she probably told my dad. And one day, tuck, 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 tuck at the door. I said, What the heck is that? Who is that? I'm not expecting anything. You yeah. expecting something? No. My dad was uh, at the door, and he came. I promise you, it's true. Huh? And uh, for me, it's a uh, boy, he's not there anymore. He died very early, my dad. And for me, it's marked me a lot in my life. Yeah. And he came to thank me and to acknowledge what I was doing. And uh, did your own path, which is good, huh? Yes, and uh, it stayed with me for a long time because uh, after that I lived at Singapore, as you know, a little bit. Yeah. And during that time, my dad died very early. He was only 57. And uh, so that, that part for me, it's, uh, it's still here. It's been, uh, you know, you, because you as, as, a, as a child and as a young man, uh, your dad is quite important and all this, and I missed... A lot, uh, because I did. I didn't really not know my dad very well. Actually, yeah. I realized when he died. I said, I don't know my dad very well, you know. Yeah. But I remember that very specifically. Yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, he said, you play golf a little bit. I said, yes. He said, he said, can you take me and show me how to play golf? Yeah. And uh, I teach teach him a little bit how to ah, to, to swing. And uh, and that's. Uh, so what have you put in there then? What are you, what are you cooking? So, Just uh, want some green. here. Swiss yeah. chard. I really love Swiss chard. And yeah. uh, this one, uh, beautiful. It's a uh, heritage, different color. That's all we need there, you see, you can see. Yeah. You want them to remain like this. Sauce is ready. Lamb yeah. has just been resting by. So if, if it's really a lot of juice, use it, put back in the sauce. Yeah. And that's it. And uh, you can cut it with the licorice, which is quite interesting. And that's the great thing. You can actually, because the licorice is soaked as well, you can eat the whole yes. thing. Yes. I mean, and it looks, you know. And it's a season. I mean, use things differently. It's, a, it's great to, to try to do something a little bit different, and that goes well with it. For me, the, the, the root, because of what they eat, we yeah. kept, you keep saying that, you see? Yeah. OK? Got this lovely Swiss char there. It just doesn't need to be completely... And that's it, the simplicity of what you cook it. It's, it voilà. it's not... It's not uh, we're not talking fine dining here. We're talking great, food. We're great... We're talking food. Voilà. 
We're talking food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> voilà, you keep yours. So, like I said, if, if the meat releases a little bit more, yeah. drop on that in here. A little bit more. We said we're talking about seasons. This is, you know, when you've got this lamb is... this good, you've got char, it's perfect. And I mean, this, this, this rump looks absolutely lovely. Let's put that on the side a little bit. So, give us the name of this dish then. And this is so pan roasted lamb or rump, skewed with some uh, licorice, you can see it here. Uh, just a little bit braise some uh, some of the Swiss chard and the jus of lamb. It's been worth the wait, as you can see. Daniel Garvish, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Right, I'm looking forward to this then. Shall right. we? Okay, well. <laughs> it should be really tender. It's quite. A, I know it's going to be perfect. Yeah, you cooked it. I did. Yeah, but I mean, but it's interesting that you can eat the licorice stick in the middle of it. Give it this lovely hint, isn't it? It's just delicious, isn't it? Thank you so much. It's just delicious. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel Gamish, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. That. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Chef Asma Khan will be cooking for us very shortly, and I've got a mask on Jersey roll potatoes. All that is coming up after the break. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now I'll be learning all about Jersey roll potatoes in this week's Little Masters, and I'll be serving up a show-stopping surf and turf burger for Jason Plato. That's coming up at the end of the show. But first, I'm here with a New Zealand-born chef whose restaurant in Port Levin. I've helped him become an honorary Cornishman. It's the brilliant Jude Karyama. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the house. First time here. I'm loving this because, I mean, <laughs> seriously, this this selection of ingredients in front of you, the smell from this already is amazing. Oh, thank it's either you that or your aftershave, one of the two. But <laughs> a combination of both, really. So, what are you going to be doing? Well, thank you very much for having me today. But today, I've got something that some, something I'd have at home, something that uh, my mum used to cook for me as a kid. Right. And every Malaysian. You know, household has a different kind of style of laksa. Yeah. And for me, this is quintessentially home. This is what my mum okay. would cook me. This sounds pretty good for home anyway. I know you want to get started now. So start with your paste, then off you go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what we have here is uh, our whole ingredients for our paste. Uh, the laksa paste starts with some Kashmiri uh, chilies. They're yeah. great chilies, quite mild, but they're really for the colour. The red colour yeah. really gives that boost into your, into your uh, paste. So they've been confident. soaked, yeah? They have been soaked in hot water. Okay. Same with these shrimps. We've got some dried shrimps. They're yeah. also being soaked in some hot water into the blender they go. Yeah. And here we've got some tamarind paste. Okay. That's going in. You can see there's a lot of ingredients here. Now you see, each, each recipe, each area, each family would have their own. Yeah. yeah. So there's two different types of uh, flavours. You've got nonya and asam laksa. This one's more nonya, which is the Chinese style. So okay. My mum's originally Chinese Malay, okay. and so this is something that she she does make. Yeah. But I think just like anything, any curry, nothing tastes the same. Whoever's cooking it, it's so different, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, so it doesn't taste anything like my mum's. Mum's is amazing. Okay. So here we go. In with some lemongrass, okay. and that goes. I've got some uh, in here. We've got some ginger. Okay. That's a lot of ginger, isn't it? It's a lot of chopped ginger, yeah? It's a lot of chopped ginger. Yeah. I think I might have... I could have cut down this paste, but I think... That's right. For me, you want to make a lot of it. It's such a good, you know, big effort, so why not make a lot of it and just have it... So while you're fridge. making that when you blend it, how on earth do you go from New Zealand to Cornwall? Well, I well, know the route's been been round and about, but but it's been long. It's, yeah. a, it's been a long. Did you journey. want to be a chef when you were were a young kid in, in New Zealand? Well, I've always loved food, and food's always been a passion of mine. My mum is just the most amazing cook, and I think a lot of us chefs. Just, we really love our mum's cookery. And uh, so I actually was doing psychology and sociology at university. Um, and so um, while I was uh, doing university, I am... Um, sorry, I'm going to put that on. Yeah, I'll let you... This is a lovely place. So while I was at university... Did you put oil in this or not? Sorry? Did you put any oil in this? No. Keep it as it is. You can see it's turning into a really nice place. It will take a while. I'm just going to brush it all down the sides. There we go. So while I was I'll at... lose this machine out of the way for you. So thank you. you thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. So while I was at university, I had a part-time job as a as a dishwasher, and it was the only way you could uh, earn a bit of money, or I could have done waitering. But um, while I was there, I, I kind of fell in love with the whole culture of of chefing and 
they, the chefs took me under my wing, uh, under their wings, sorry, and we ended up, you know, uh, giving me more prep jobs, and I was really enticed into cooking just by being a kitchen porter, and here I am. So how do you go then from New Zealand, wanting to be a chef, to working as a kitchen porter, to, <laughs> to, to where we are in Cornwall? Fast forward to Cornwall, because... Fast forward, yeah. You've got an amazing place, well, a couple of amazing places in Cornwall now. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, um, I, I did actually come to, to England with a two-year working visa, and I was only going to be over here for two years, and... Uh, Suddenly, I met this one girl and got married, and that was it. And 25, 20, 25 years later, I'm still here, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, it's a great country. Um, and at that time, uh, my late wife, uh, family was from Cornwall, and so we spent all our holidays down there, and we dreamt of having a, a little restaurant down there. And that was 25 years ago. And, uh, yeah, Because it we is are. a beautiful place. Anybody that hasn't been, you're in this sort of... Horseshoe shape bit, and you look out onto it. It's a beautiful part. It's a beautiful oh, part of Cornwall. Oh, we, we are so lucky down there in Cornwall. Not only just the the people, but really, it's the the quality of ingredients down there is amazing. Well, I know you want to cook with some of them now. Yeah, so yeah. Get, talk get about one. that. Here we go. Here's yeah. some hake. Yeah. What's going on? So the, the idea is you build this up in layers, so you put, you're cooking the fish separate and then add into it as well. Absolutely. So we've got this hake just being. I mean, it's. All the flavours in here, this is what you, what you want. I'm going to season this up with a little bit of fish sauce, yeah. maybe a little bit of palm sugar, but I think it just tasted quite nice and sweet. These are really lovely garnishes that go in there. It makes it such a big bowl of beautiful ingredients. See, I haven't been to New Zealand, but I get the feeling that this, these are the kind of flavours that you get. And this is one of the fascinating bits. I haven't been to New Zealand, I haven't been to Australia. You haven't lived. I know, You've got to exactly. get over there. You've got to get there. I mean, the food there is spectacular, I've heard, you know. It really is. I think the nicest thing about... Because um, I can't really talk for Australia. I do love Australia. It's really great, but obviously I'm a Kiwi. We're... Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. try not to promote Australia too much. <laughs> uh, not that we're for New Zealand Tourism Board. Yeah. But um, what I really love about New Zealand is that you can go anywhere from a pie shop to a sandwich shop to a, a nice restaurant. And everything seems like value for money. Yeah. I think there's great ingredients everywhere, which is really the key, isn't it? It's really yeah. good ingredients. Um, another thing about New Zealand is that it's a real melting pot of cultures. Well, yeah. look at me. So <laughs> it's a mix of everything. Um, and uh, for me, that um, shows in the food that, yeah. that is served in New Zealand. Yeah. So what's the definition between the two? Let's go, then what's the definition? What's the, what's the two differences between well, the two? One is local and one is uh, more Chinese influence. So one's right. got more coconut milk, yeah. uh, which I think is the, the well, that's the type I've got, which I think is more delicious. So one sure one is one has, has got no coconut milk in it, and one one has or yes. So no, they do. Um, one's got more coconut milk. One has more um, sweet and sour flavours. Right. And okay. um, this one is a more coconut milky. I okay. love this style, and that's that's just the style I was brought up with. So okay. uh, here we go. We're yeah. going to pop some mussels in here now. Yeah. I think everything's just starting to come together. Get rid of those. It's looking pretty good to me, isn't it? Thank goodness for that. Wow. So here we go. Yeah. We're just going to add a little bit more coriander to the uh, mussels in the soup. Ready it's when you're ready. Are. Put some of that through. I oh, know I could have done a much easier dish, James. Or well, you you quickly learn easy. on the show. You, you got really complicated to start with, and then the more you come back, the less you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, there's something to, uh, for the future. Yeah. That's feature juice uh, ideal thing, I think. That's, that's it. beautiful. It looks that's amazing. That's that. That's the fish on the side over here. Put that over there. I think the only thing left in the drawers is about a wooden spoon and a whisk. That's the only thing you haven't <laughs> used. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not cleaning up. Sorry, crew. <laughs> <laughs> but you do get to eat the food, so that's absolutely fine. Pop that down there. And now, it's time for plating. So in here, we've got a mix yeah. of uh, egg noodle, which yeah. is great. I love a little bit of mix. I can never decide which noodle to use. Whether I, lo I love vermicelli, I love there's a rice noodle. I love uh, flat rice noodles. Yeah. I love egg noodles. So I thought, why not put both in there? Okay. You can so is this, the, this is the kind of food I've seen you serve. You serve this in the restaurant. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The luxo. Um, a lot of the food that I do at Kai Kota Kai is really. Memories of my childhood. So it's right. read my mum's, my take on what my mum does. So um, when we were little kids, one of my favourite dishes I did down there was a little crab bao bun that I used to do. And when we were kids, we used to go down to this lovely beach in New Zealand called Waikanae Beach. And we used to get little blue swimmer crabs down there. So 
We used to catch that, the mum would have her Singapore chilli paste. We'll be in a caravan and mum would be, you know, obviously... See, this knows. is what I love, the difference between me and him. You know, he goes down there, catches blue crabs. We went to Bernie Inns and had fancy mustard for the first... You haven't got a clue what a Bernie Inn has, it? <laughs> no, it's no a... idea. Bernie Inn, no. no. idea. It was the only time you got to taste fancy mustard. That was the only time you could ever <laughs> taste French mustard. Oh, you start with that with a rump steak and then fight over the salad bar. That was about it, really. Oh. No, we had this this beautiful blue summer crabs that we used to go and catch. The mum would make... Uh, had the Singapore chilli paste already, and then she'd make, you know, Singapore chilli crab. Mm. And we used to eat that um, with white bread. So we used to, like, mop up all the juices, the white bread. Magic. And uh, at the end of the day, it ended up being... Um, I did a dish like that in uh, Cody Kai. So I did a version of it, which was a soft-shell crab with Singapore sauce. Yeah. Um, and it was a bell bun. So the white, white bell bun was, like, white bread. Yeah. And um, so it reminded me of home. So it's like a... A little family, little holiday, really. Sounds good. I can hear things bubbling away everywhere. So, right. here we go. Yeah. Got some lovely mussels going in like that. Yeah. And next, we've got our lovely bok choy. You can have as little or as much as you like of this, because this is, like I say, it's a, this is really a luxury version of, uh, of a luxa. Yeah. So, there we go. Got that in there. Then we've got some seafood. Here we go in here. We've got some lovely hake. Oh, actually, I'll start with the scallops. That is the biggest, fattest scallop you'll find. A little bit of hake. A little bit of the prawns. Here we go. Prawns are in. Pop that on the side for now. Yeah, I'm really sorry about your kitchen, but it's a lovely kitchen, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> right, a few of these fish balls. They go in there. I mean, I don't think you'll see many street hawkers doing it this way because it's right. just so much ingredients, but it's delicious. Some bean sprouts and some crunch. Some of your lovely mix of herbs, some coriander. That's a really fun dish, isn't it? So looks amazing. Some egg. Thank you very much. There you go. The lime. There we go. One line. Dude, Ooh. that looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. So give us the name of this dish, then. This is Malaysian laksa. Good luck replicating that at home. <laughs> Dude, everybody. Thank you very much. Easy. Right, I'm looking forward to this. It's like a feast in a bowl. Can I have a try? Yes, then? you certainly can. Thank you very much. This looks amazing. It smells amazing. How are you going to get in there? I don't know, really. You're you, supposed to eat you it with a... You use your spoon. What are you, you supposed to eat to... with? Chopstick spoon? Yeah, I do. For me, it's chopsticks and spoon. So you get in there, chow the flavours, have some of the noodles, drink some of the soup. Well, it's quiet. I think that's a good thing. Well, that is a good... You know, the taste from that, it's worth the effort, though, isn't it, really? Because oh, it's so I've worth tried it. so many different ones of this and so many different pastes. But you, that's just knockout, isn't it? And it's the way you cook cook out... You need that 20 minutes so you to cook it all out. Absolutely. It's getting that sweetness through all the, the paste. And uh, if, you're, you know, if you want more spice, add that. Add a little bit of chilli in there. Have some sliced chilli in the side. Have a little bowl with it. And, it's uh, one of the nicest dishes I've eaten in a very, very long time. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Jude, everybody. Yeah. Definitely coming back, yeah? <laughs> I'd love to. Definitely Thank coming you. back. We'll just <laughs> give us six months to clean up afterwards. Right, anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, Chef Osma Khan will be taking over the kitchen duties very shortly. I'll be rusting up a surf and turf burger for Jason Plato at the end of the show. We'll see you back here in a couple of minutes when we've got a masterclass in Jersey roll potatoes. Gives me time to finish this. I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> this is delicious. Oh, good. Thank you. Welcome back. Now, I'm revving up for uh, the arrival of top racing driver Jason Plato and Chef Asma Khan will be dropping by the house next. 
But first, it's time for this week's little masters. And this week's masters is about one of my favourite ingredients available this time of the year. Bang in the middle of the season, it's, of course, the Jersey Royal Potatoes. It's an amazing product, really. It's been around for about 130 years. This is the famous Jersey Royal, this sort of shape over here. It was developed and, and sort of invented, or if you, that's such a thing, by Hugh De La Haye. Uh, he harvested this kidney-shaped potatoes about 130 years ago, cut it into four, replanted it, and hence the Jersey Roll potatoes were formed. It was actually called a Jersey Fluke uh, originally by the local newspapers, but this is where you get the famous Jersey Roll potatoes for. It's absolutely delicious. And one that you should always, always get if you wander around the supermarkets, really, because it's only available for a certain time of the year. Like I said, it's, it's a short season. So how do you prepare them? The best way to prepare these is not scrape them, certainly not peel them, because a lot of the flavour that you get from these Jersey Roll potatoes are actually in the skins. And I don't really like it when people peel off all the flavour from that. So what we do is you just use... I like to use a little sponge like that, soak them in a little bit of water, but they're absolutely delicious. Look at these. And that's all you need to do with them. And I've got them prepared here. So I'm going to do these sort of three ways. One classic, which is just with parsley and butter, which is just how it should be, just uh, boiled in there. But uh, the director and producer of the show, you need to fill in six minutes. So we're going to do two dishes with it. Um, I'm going to do a wonderful little soup with it potato and watercress soup, which is amazing with Jersey Rolls. But I'm also going to do a wonderful dish with squid with, with it as well, with a lovely little dressing. So what we're going to do with the, these, you can just thinly slice them. Now, the reason why I'm thinly slicing them is the speed at which we're going to cook it, really. So we can take our potatoes and then take a little bit of full-fat milk. So the milk can go into our pan, like that. Now, it's a good way to make soup like this. Do you just use meat, milk at its base. You don't need any uh, shallots, any garlic, that kind of stuff. You just use some milk. And whether you're doing potato soup, carrot soup, parsnip soup, same thing. Same, same process applies, really. So what I'm going to do with these potatoes is just cut them nice and thin. Just speeds up the cooking time so they can go straight into there, like that. And like most potatoes, you can fry these as well. They're brilliant. They make amazing crisps. But we're just going to slice them nice and thin so they cook nice and evenly. Like that. Now, this is a potato and watercress soup, so the temptation is to add the watercress too early. What we don't want to do with that is add the watercress till we're blending it. That's why it keeps that beautiful green colour. So bring this to the boil, get this rapidly going. This is going to take about sort of four or five minutes to cook. While that's happening, while that's coming to the boil, we can turn our attention to the squid that we got on here. Now, I love this with just some cooked Jersey Roll potatoes. I absolutely love squid. It's brilliant. So the way you prepare it is this. Just Open it up like that. And then what I would do, really, with this is score it. So you can open it up and just with almost the weight of a knife, that's where you use the heavy knife, is you just cut this through. Just roughly like that and roughly like that. And you keep doing this till you've got all the squid prepared. You can cut it up into pieces so it's much more manageable to eat. But the same thing applies like that. Just open it up like this can scrape out the centre. There we go. And again, the weight of the knife. So I'll just keep, keep my eye on this milk over here. We don't want to catch, so bring it to the boil. So, again, this side. Very, very quick to cook your squid. So I've got a hot griddle over here. So again, cut it like this. I've got a little tray. So we can put our squid on. Like that. And then we can take our Nice little tentacles on there as well. That's for my lunch. Wash your hands. Again, wash your hands in cold water. It doesn't cook the fish onto your hands and make your hands smell. So don't use hot water. Cold water first, then hot. And then we got our squid. So I'll season it up like that. Some salt, some pepper, some olive oil like that. And then a hot griddle. So I've got a griddle over here, but. You can do this on a barbecue, but either way, make sure it's really, really hot. If you haven't got a griddle pan, don't worry. Nice hot frying pan is what you need. <clears throat> but oil the squid rather than put oil in the frying pan. And we just put this direct onto here. If you're using a griddle pan, make sure it's really super hot. That's it. And a frying pan, super hot before you cut the squid on. So it doesn't take very long to cook at all. Like that. <clears throat> so 
we'll just leave that cooking away nicely just for a second. Meanwhile, we can turn our attention to our sort of dressing for this. Dressing for this is chopped parsley, chopped chilli, lemon zest and lemon juice and a little bit of oil. You can call this gremolata if you like, but gremolata's usually got garlic in it. And I don't think you need it with this, but particularly with the, the Jersey Royals. So you want the Jersey Royals to taste of Jersey Royals rather than sort of cover them up with flavour. But this is just incorporating the flavour of the squid and everything else. So just chop it roughly like that. And let's do this all in one go, which is great. That's fine. Keep your attention to the squid because we don't want to overcook this. Look at that. It's off. So you get the nice marks on the squid. On there. Very, very quick to cook as well. It more goes on, cooked and off. Try not to overcook it because that's now done. There we go. Take this off. A few bits of this. That can all come on there. So you've got your squid. There, done. Like that. So keep that in the oven, keep it warm. And then finish this off, really. We've got a little bit of lemon zest, like that. Touch of that. Touch of chilli. Bit of red chilli we can chop up. Very, very simple, that's the key to this. Nice and pure flavours. So a little bit of chopped chilli, chopped up. Then we can take some lemon juice. You can almost mix it all in here, really. A little bit of olive oil. Like that. Mix it all up. There we go. You've got these beautiful flavour of everything else. And then you can grab your little platter. Keep my eye on that one. Don't want to catch the milk. Then we've got our glorious squid, which can then come out on here. So you've got all the nice, beautiful flavours. You don't have to do this, you can do this with prawns. Chicken and, and works really well with this, actually, as well. A few bits of that. And then we've got our Jersey Royals, which you can just lift out of here. Look at these, you can just chop these up. Just put them on there. So you've got this warm salad, really. And then you've got your lovely dressing, which you can take this and just sprinkle this over the top. So this is your lemon, your chilli, your parsley. Really simple. Over the top of there. And a nice, good glug of olive oil just to finish this off. Take a nice little glug of this over the top. And there we have dish number one, really. Nice and simple. Beautiful flavours. Tastes amazing, that. And then we can finish off our little soup now. So these potatoes are now... Cooked, I'll just check with a knife. There you go. They're cooked, they're perfect. So what we can do now is take our blender and then just fill this up. Now, you've got to be careful when you're doing one of these, when you're doing the blending the soup hot, that you don't put the lid on. It creates a vacuum and goes everywhere. So just pour this in. Get your potatoes in. There you go. Now, it's always a good idea to keep a little bit of liquor left back, really, for this, because sometimes when you blend it, it goes a bit thick. But start it off on the blender first, then you'll find out. So, again, like I said, be careful when you do this. It's a good idea not to put the centre bit in. And with this, really, it's the best idea to use a cloth. But make sure it's on low, first of all. Flick it on, and then start to speed it up. As I was saying, you can tell where the mixture, when you're doing it, just to show you what the texture's like, you can tell you need to add a little bit more liquid to this. There you go, look. 
So it's a little bit thick, a bit starchy. So what we want to do with this is we've got a little bit of milk or a little bit of cream left over on the side, and we can add that to it. So again, cloth over it, like that. And while that's blending, we can start to add our watercress now. The reason why we add it now is to keep the colour. So we stick our watercress in. Touch of cream. A little bit of milk. To start to bring the texture back to the soup consistency that we want. And then you add more watercress. By adding it now, while it's still hot, you get this beautiful colour. Now start to turn it up. Right now, season. Soup requires plenty of salt and pepper, so don't be shy with it. And keep the machine going a bit, because the longer the machine goes, the more beautiful colour you get from it. A bit noisy, but... And there we have it. You see, you've got this beautiful look. Rich, look at that. Glorious. That's what you get. One thing you don't want to be doing with this, really, as well, is once you get to this stage, Really, with the soup, try not to re-boil it again too much, because otherwise it's just going to overcook all the time. So once you get to this stage, if you want to heat it up, just gradually heat it up, but only do it once or twice, because it just takes the colour away. But you've got this beautiful Jersey Royal and watercress soup. Like that. We garnish that. We've got a little bit of creme fraiche over here. So, a nice little dollop of that. So, it's in there. We've got some double cream. And then I've got a little bit of oil over here. We just blend this with a little bit of parsley. Um, and this is just blended over heat, really. And it produces this amazing coloured oil. And you can use the same oil to, to flavour that as well. But it's just blended at 50 degrees. 52 degrees, and you get this amazing oil. But there's your little jersey rolls. We'll take a little bit of watercress with it as well. And then, of course, you've got one more final thing, is you can take your jersey roll potatoes, we'll drain them off. Like that. Into your bowl. Oops. So you've got your jersey roll potatoes into your bowl. This is how I was going to do it, but I needed to fill in six minutes. But you take a bit of butter, because that's the best way to eat Jersey Rolls, with a little bit of chopped parsley over the top. But either way, whatever you do, these are banging season at the moment. Get them, because the reason why they're so highly prized is they taste like no other potato. They really are spectacular, but there you have it. So three different ways, one classic, two alternate, with the amazing Jersey Rolls. Enjoy that. There you go. Yay! Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about, a little mask us, then do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when the very talented Asma Khan will be here. But before you go, the best way to eat Jersey Roll potatoes, the best way to eat potatoes in general, is always equal quantities, butter and potato. Welcome back. Now, touring car champion Jason Plato and a good mate of mine will be making a pit stop at the house very shortly. But first, a chef who's gone from running supper clubs to feeding Hollywood A-listers at a hit London restaurant, Darjeeling Express. It's the fabulous Asma Khan! <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Now, this looks amazing. This amazing, amazing selection of veggies that we've got here. Yes, I'm... Uh, I, I, as, I just thought it would be great to cook vegetables. Uh, for a change, because normally I don't. Wonderful. Whenever I come here, I cook chicken. Yeah. Uh, so I'm making a sada pulao, which is a very simple Bengali pulao with cashew nuts and raisins. Yeah. And I'm making something which is really very royal in its in the whole story. It's a Navratan pulao named after a kind of jewelry setting. 
And so it's a great way to use up vegetables. I know you want to get the rice on first, so yes. off you go with the rice then. So, yes. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm getting the garam masala. Uh, I've got to get the garam masala, then... So where fries. does this come from in India? Where, where does this originate from? The, the, the rice is Bengali. Yeah. And the, and the korma is from my father's side. Of the, so it's pretty much my mother father's side. Okay. So yeah, so I'm just getting this. What have we got in there already? So it's it's cassia bark, which yeah. is impressive looking. Looks like part of a tree. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, not this curly woolly cinnamon because that's like we don't use it. But I know everyone calls it. You cinnamon. don't you don't use it all. No, we don't. We use cinnamon for sweet things, but yeah. we use this for rice and meats because it has a great flavor. Now <laughs> my aim in life is to make sure that I do not burn any of this garam masala. <laughs> Uh, I'm still pretty much a gas person, so I've, these, these things are... So you've got cardamom and what? what cardamom and cloves, okay. and then I've got the cashew nuts going in. Cardamom, yeah. cloves, bay leaf, and uh, the cassia bark. Yeah. Cashew nuts can burn because they have oil. They can burn really fast. Okay. So you've got to really, really watch it. Yeah. And much as I would like to see your face, I'm so <laughs> I'm going to stare at the cashew nuts instead because I cannot afford to burn them. That too on television. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> My mother will be calling me, oh my God, you don't know how to fry cashew nuts. So I, I, I can't mention you, but I know you're going to concentrate on the, there, they're ready, they're, they're ready. I'll let you get them all out first. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to be the, 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 the part of the rice that we're going to do. Yeah, well. yeah, this part of the rice. And, and it's, it's really, I think, wonderful. Uh, cashew nuts, I, I absolutely adore. And they are, and you can replace, if you don't like raisins, a lot of people don't like raisins, yeah. you can replace this with any other kind of dried fruit that you have in your house. You can use cranberries, or even half open packet of mixed anything that you have. Yeah. My God, I have managed to do all of this without burning it. <laughs> <laughs> this is my nightmare. Last well, night, I dreamt I burnt all of this. Did you? Well, yeah. most people do when they're using this hob, because it's, 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 it requires a little bit of practice, but... Yes, yes, right. and I'm, I'm slightly intimidated by that. Right. So, so in here, I'm just going to finish putting the rice in. Yeah. I have... Uh, Caramelized onions, because if I was to caramelize it for real, it would take forever. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. I'm probably it's amazing gonna... the amount of onions that you use in sort of Indian cookery. I mean... Yes, I, yes. I... It's... And onions are... I, I, I personally feel that, you know, we... If you get it right... Yeah. So I'm just kind of measuring the water, which is double the quantity. Yeah. If you get the onions right in Indian cooking, then that's half the battle. Yeah. So in here are yeah. my caramelized onions. I'm going to put all of this back. Yeah. Put the rice in. So half you wash the rice with this. Yes, I wash the rice. I've soaked it. Now I've taken it out. So soaking the rice, washing it is very very important. Okay. So I'm just going to add the water. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God. There you go. <laughs> this is quite scary. <laughs> So I'm going to put it on the boil, cover it, yeah. and I'm going to move it. On there, so, to go. yeah, it should be okay. Yeah. Now, can I ask you about the book? Because now you now the panic's over. Now is the it? panic is over. Yes. Okay. Yes. So can I ask you about this? This is this is the new book. Yes. Uh, and this, th tell me, tell me about. Is it Amu? Amu. Yes. Is that that's related to mother? Is that yes, right? Yes. Yes. It's uh, it's what Indian Muslims call mother. It's a mixture of Amma, which is a kind of spiritual mother used in India and um, which is used more in the Middle East as mother. So it's combined in India, and as we say, ammo. It's only said in certain families. Now, I was reading this book yesterday. Your mother sounds a fascinating person. She is, she is. With an amazing history. Was you part of the royal, royal family? Yes, yes. Yeah. And she's, she's incredible because I wrote this book over the pandemic, and I realised how much I was like her. And I was able to give it to her earlier in a year for her birthday. It is amazing. And you mentioned this this sort of what you're making now, this jewel. This is you Yes. In your bridal wear. Yes, in my bridal wear. So you mentioned this and, and this this relates to this dish, does it? How does this, it relate to this? This is called Navratan. I mean, I know everybody thinks that all Indian dishes are called curries. They're not. They're not. All our dishes have a name. This is a very royal dish which has got very regal connotations. I've actually bought my own bridal set to show you. Right. Because what I... Do, what do you, I see you concentrate on this now. What have you got in there now? So I put yogurt in there. OK. I'm going to put in some of the masala as well. Yeah. Then all the vegetables go in. I'm going to turn your rice down a little bit. There you go. 
God, I miss not having you next to me to go. <laughs> <laughs> when will that time another come? Another year, another year, hopefully. Well, less than a year, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Less than oh, a year. Oh, God. Yeah. So, garlic ginger goes in. Yeah, so you mentioned the jewellery set. Yes, and the jewellery set is normally given to a new bride. Can, uh, I, can I open this? Because yes, I know please you've got do. your hands full of yes. yogurt and bits and pieces. Yeah, I don't so want to get I'm this. I'm going to ruin the whole thing. Fine. Yeah, exactly. So, this, this is. Explain to us what we've got in here. Cause th this looks beautiful. Look at this. So this is Navratan, and this is where the idea comes from. Nine jewels. So this is a royal setting where nine gems are used. This is given to a new bride. This was what was given to me when I got married and I came to my husband's house. And right. I'm going to make sure I don't burn this. I know you did. <laughs> yeah, go on. And it's, it's very, very emotional. It's very can something... I, can that... I pick one? Pick yes, one yes, up? yes. That's the... I think your hand might be too big for that, but that's basically you wear across that way. That looks beautiful, doesn't it? I mean, this this is clearly all handmade. It's absolutely yes. gorgeous. And what you can't see, probably, is you can. This is like filigree, isn't it? You can see all the way through yes, it. Yes, yes. Beautiful. It is very, very. Uh, Look at that, it's very know. traditional. It's a royal thing, and this korma is called after this. You know why? Because it's got all these different colours. Wow. Most people know things as korma, which is. You know, chicken korma. Yeah. Let's see what's happened to this. Yay! Look at that, my you God. see? Yes, yes, I am sold. Temperature was perfect, you see? You know something you're wasted? You should be selling things. You <laughs> selling things? Selling anything. You could sell anything to anyone. <laughs> I mean, I came here saying, I, uh, I'm, I'm so skeptical. I don't think electric and thing works. Yeah. I'm sold, I'm sold. This is about your, your restaurant you wanted to go, you, you got, a, well, it's gas, but you... you yeah, because the thing is that a lot of restaurants that are available now, do not let you use gas. Yeah. And uh, look at that. You see? I'm so impressed. Wow. Look at that. Yes, it works. I've dropped some, but that's it's fine. That's right, fine. I'm a messy cook. It's... First time I saw you cook on television, yeah. I saw you clearing up as you cooked, and I was thinking, this guy's on television. Just look at him. <laughs> I mean, this is so impressive. Maybe because you're a pastry chef. I see pastry chefs are just more. Maybe as because it's my house. <laughs> and, and okay, yeah, so this is yeah. done. And, and, and I rely on people coming here and trashing my house. Oh, my God. I'm very good. I haven't messed up your house at all. I've been very respectful. <laughs> okay, so That's here... Amazing. How good is that? Look at that. Beautiful, no? And it's the, the key to this, though, is not overcooking. It's vegetables. not overcooking because you need... You, you want everything to still have a crunch. Colour, but yes. colour like your jewellery. Yes, colour like my jewellery, yes. I've got, it, I've got it in prime position there. I'll just get rid of that. You can put your dish next I'm to that. I'm just going so to really try and sure. find somewhere to clean this bit, but I'll clean later. There's a little cloth there if you want yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Looks amazing. Smells amazing. I hope you have cutlery. Yeah. I know it's going to taste amazing. So give us the name of this dish. So this is uh, Navratan Korma. Navratan Korma, which is the jewellery setting, and Sada Palau. From your new book as well. Asma, everybody! <laughs> Right, huh? So, Asma, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap. I'm going to have this to taste. Yeah. But then what I'm going to do is going to give you that because I don't want to be responsible for that. <laughs> this is... Uh... <laughs> So, what is the, is the idea that you pass that on to the next generation? Is that what is that the idea with that? Yes, degree? this is the idea that you pass it on, and it's uh, this whole idea of, of bringing color to someone's life. And so, this is very mild, and it's gentle. It's and it allows all the vegetables to come to be the star. It's great, though, isn't it? You could imagine eating this in you know forty degrees in Calcutta. Uh, you need the vegetables to be crunchy, and you need it to be. Uh, and it's not that I'm doing this because it's the best. This is how we serve it. And you home. can cook it in anything. Gas, electric, you've just proven <laughs> as well. You can cook it in You missed your calling. Apart from, being, <laughs> apart from being the rock star, you could be this to is, sell things. This is delicious. Well, best of luck with the book. Good luck with everything. Asma Khan, everybody. Thank you. Right, we've still got time for one more final course. Join me after the break when I'll be behind the hops. Actually, I'll be outside cooking surf and turf burgers for Mr Jason Plato. I'll see you in a bit. This is delicious. Welcome back to the last part of the show, but I'm here with, in the kitchen with a familiar face and one of the fastest men on four wheels this country has ever produced. It's Mr Jason Plato! Yay! 
Do you know what? I love that. I love that. Yeah, like, I mean, it's all nonsense, but I'll buy that. That's great. Yeah. Well, you quick done. Yeah, feet actually falling out the pub. But anyway, hey, shush. I know that one. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about everything. F one and Dave Ramsey. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's you know the, the guys which race in F1 at the, I mean all of them, not all of them are great drivers, but yeah. you know the guys at the back aren't great drivers, but that you'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the guys at the sharp end, I mean they are supremely talented and athletes beyond you know to do best part of an hour and 45 minutes in those cars with in what's that going on else. in the heat. I mean, they are incredibly fit, very disciplined, and that's where I would have gone wrong, because I wouldn't have been going down the gym. You know, imagine <laughs> getting paid, what, half a million dollars a race, and then, and, then, and then going down the gym, or going out and having fun. But your notorious battles you've had over the years, you've had some, you know, infamous battles with Matt Neal, and, so, you know, to pick fights with somebody like that, a six-foot-six was a black belt, isn't he? Yes, yes, he was. I mean, I did pick a fight, but I kept my helmet on. Right. <laughs> I know, you know, that's... But, uh, Ian, you know, it's well documented about me and the history with Matt Neal, but it's only because we were at the sharp end all the time. And do you know yeah. what? I, I don't... You know, I, I don't go to racetracks to, to have a social life and to make friends with everybody. I hate everybody, and they're the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what's more is, everyone's so two-faced. And they'll pretend they're being nice, but they're stabbing you in the back. I don't want to do all that sort of stuff, so yeah. I just be horrible to everybody, to their face. Right. And it's, <laughs> it's served me, it's served me OK. You know, cos I do play the role of Dick Dastardly. But isn't that, like you said, that's fun to do, isn't it, really? Because... Yeah. You, but also, when you're doing that, you're not, you're not doing that and at the back. No. No. You, it's as if, you know, you're, you're, even now, after all these years, you're still uber, uber competitive. That's the great thing about it, isn't it? Well, see, you wouldn't do it if you weren't. No, I you wouldn't. You get, you know, I remember having what... on you for many, many years. When you drove some cars, I remember, you, you're in a position where you're just not even competitive, and it's it's, it's awful. It's awful. It's awful. I, it, I, been, I, I been die. with you, and I, I just... die. I, it kills yeah. me. Uh, but interesting enough, you know, the decision I made th this year, and I announced it at the beginning of the year, was you know I've announced that this, you know, 2022 will be my. So my, my my swan song, if you like. So I've announced my retirement from touring cars so at the end of this year. You're going to be here every weekend, then? Well, I might change my mind. Oh, okay. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I might change my mind. But also, I just want, want... I don't want to just drift away and not be competitive. And I know, deep down, I'm still quick. I can do the business. I need the right kit. And I want to I wanna say goodbye to it whilst I'm still having a go and yeah. fighting for wins. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's that. So tell us about the car this year. They won't tell us about the car this year. Well, year amusingly, year. you know, my, my arch enemy, if you like, over the years has been Matt Neal with a Honda team, and I've never been anywhere close to a Honda because I, I mean, I get punched if I go in their garage, right. <laughs> and, and I've damaged a few over the years. Yeah. But I'm I'm, I'm in a an a, you know in a in a in a car which is supplied by Team Dynamics. My arch nemesis. I'm in a Honda. Yeah. But it's a good car. And literally, a few, you know, not that long ago, I managed to get underneath it and have a proper good look round it. And I, I have to say, it's a really nice bit of kit. It's a great bit of kit. Well, we look forward to really seeing you throughout the rest of the season as well. And one of the, the amazing stories that I, did, that I do love in your book as well was when Williams dropped you a little present at your house. <laughs> That I just think oh, this is just brilliant. Was... It's just only Frank Williams could organise this and do this. Oh, it was brilliant. Because you 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 crashed a few cars for them. No, hold on, hold on. That's a bit strong. Crashed a few cars. I for did them. a few body panels, and there was enough to make a complete car. So you crashed the body panels. <laughs> right. but, yeah. So yeah. they they did what? They did. Well, what? well, this is in my first year. So obviously a new boy in town. The fact I lived in in Oxford. Yeah. And the factory was at, uh, in Didcot. So I was there nearly every single day of the week. And it was a big factory. It was like 50, 60 staff there. Yeah. And during the year, I never spotted this car being built in the back of the workshop. And it was out of all the bits I'd bent. <laughs> <laughs> and what they did was, and it was... It, I can remember it like yesterday. We were, I was testing... We were testing in over in, in France, and it was the day that there'd been a fire in... Ber in um, Heathrow Airport. Yeah. So they shut the terminal and we were delayed and we got we got rerouted to Birmingham. And it was literally mid mid December. And by the time I got home, um was about one o'clock in the morning because of all the delays. And I walked, I used to come into my place via the back garden and stuff, go in the back park and walk to the back garden. And as I walked down the pathway, over on the left hand side, there's like a bit of a race patio thing where my barbecue was. And I walked in there and I looked over and there was a touring car 
on the patio. <laughs> but do you know what? I wish I'd, I wish I'd kept it, actually. You should have kept it. It was, it was broad. But that's what Frank was like. You know, he had a brilliant sense of humour. I'll be forever indebted for that well, man to give and me a break. If you want to know more stories, we can see you on fifth gear that you're doing as well at the moment, but also doing your podcast as well, because this podcast is amazing as well. You can you can tune into the podcast. So. Uh, yeah, we do, we do this pop, pop podcast, which is sponsored by Adrian Flux, but basically we get... I mean, you, you, you were our first guest. Yes. We just get interesting people from all walks of life that we, we all know, so it could be Sir Chris Hoy, it could be James Martin, could be anyone, and we talk about their, their history... The earliest memories of cars, yeah, you know, and, and these are all pet petrol heads. You know, I ask, I've asked every guest a question. We've had we're on series season five now, I think. Yeah. Uh, I've asked every guest a question. You were the first one, and you you shirked the answer. You wouldn't give an answer, and, and to be fair, no one else has. And the question is, what car, when, where, and with who did you have your first bit of action in anyway, a car? There's a burger with chips. <laughs> <laughs> It's surf and turf with a nice old Yuzu mayonnaise. Love him. Jason Blaser, everybody! <laughs> why, why do you have to make it so tall? I won't get that in my gob. Trust me, you've got a big enough mouth to fill that. Just have to get your nose out of the way. Whoa, that's a bit <laughs> spiky, isn't it? <laughs>